Um, I've kept uh, everybody on mute, but after the lecture, uh, I will take a few questions because there are more than 100 participants. So it's impossible to answer everyone. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that uh, if you have any specific questions which can't be answered during this, so there is a method in which you can uh, ask the questions through PV works, and I will at some point reply to them. And also, when I start sharing my screen, you will see my email ID there. Uh, you can also send emails there. And uh, uh, the other thing before I start, uh, I will start sharing my screen now. Uh, Ranjan, just to uh, one more thing, sorry for cutting in. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, you are uh, one of the co-hosts of the meeting, and the participants cannot unmute themselves to ask the questions. Also, I will unmute them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So, as I was saying, uh, now you will see my screen here, and uh, okay. <laughs> So uh, I will be covering my talk in uh, two. In fact, there are two talks, one today and one tomorrow. And the one tomorrow is primarily on spectroscopy. And today I will be talking a little bit about introduction of telescopes and uh, a few definitions. And then we will move on to the photometry and other things. I understand that on first, that was last week you had introductory astronomy, a few lectures by Shoma. So I really don't know what all covered. So maybe there will be some repetitions, but that's good for you to, to revise those concepts. So this will be all mostly concepts in today's talk. And, uh, and also towards the end of tomorrow's talk, I will be listing out uh, some of the references which are directly related to to these two talks. And uh, the participants on the refresher group uh, will be given some questions at the end related to my talks also. So that's why it's important for you to go through them carefully. In fact, these two talks, the talk material will be also posted soon by the organizer. So let's start with uh, So you can see my email ID there on the cursors. This is rag at uh, What I will be covering will be basically different types of small telescopes. Uh, many of you might have seen a small telescope or at least a binocular. And even at school days, you might even have made some binoculars. So that is minimum one would expect because we all used to do it at our school days. Then I will be talking advantages, disadvantages of the, these two types of telescopes. Again, definitions of magnification, <laughs> light gathering power, telescope mounts. And somewhere here, you will see that we will revisit the black body radiation, which at least in MSc level, definitely in BSc level and MSc level, you would have gone. But this will be more focused towards the astronomy application. So that is the kind of outline for today's talk. Many of these things which are written here, you really uh, don't have to read them so carefully. Uh, Ranjan, just sorry, one more thing. I don't think the slides are changing. We are just seeing the first slide, which is telescopes, different types, Ranjan Gupta. Slides are change, not changing. I have changed it. Uh, no, I, I think there's, uh, when you have shared the slides, or maybe if you... Should I? Yeah, it is full screen now. Just a minute, what is the issue? So from the Zoom's perspective, so are you sharing the whole desktop or sharing just the slides? Just a minute. Hmm? So now is, how is it? It went to the next slide with two main types of telescopes. No, so, so yes, this it, one, it, is, it is changing now. So refracting and reflecting telescopes. True, true, but uh, when I go to full screen, why it is not changing the strange? 
It has never happened. So uh, let's see. I will make it full screen now. So now it is full screen. No, it's not full screen. This is strange. What could be the reason? Because now it is changing on my. No, it it is not changing on the. So good that you told. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I will leave it at that. Yeah, this is this is readable, so we can read this. That's right. Because all my slides are fairly big font, so. This is something strange. Why it didn't? Anyway, so uh, uh, sorry for the interruption. So there are two types of telescopes: refracting and reflecting. Uh, refractor, as the word says, it uses glass, primarily glass lenses, and uh, the light has to refract through the glass. Uh, so there is hardly any reflection taking place. Of course, uh, at each glass surface, you have absorption and uh, primary some reflection, some losses, but most of it is transmitted. So it uses a glass lens as an objective and you also have an eyepiece, which will also be uh, made of glass. So we'll soon see the, uh, the sketch of these things. And the reflector telescope, again, instead of the objective being a glass lens, it is a mirror. So, which means uh, the number of optical surfaces from which the light is passing is greatly reduced. So, you can see here the top uh, is a refracting telescope where on this side you have the lens, which in this case becomes a primary mirror in reflecting case. The eyepiece is here, even here it is an eyepiece, but here the light has to come out from there. So, let's say this part doesn't change much, but uh, the the major advantage, which we will soon see, is because it's a uh, it's a mirror, and uh, this kind of telescope, the refracting telescope, has been there for several centuries. In fact, Galileo uh, first built this telescope, and uh, it was his invention. But and he saw the Jupiter's moon and other things. But really speaking, even before Galileo, which was 400 years back. The lenses were known because people were using in spectacles. So it was not an unknown thing, but it was really used as a telescope first time by Galileo. So the year of astronomy, which was celebrated some years back, 2008, was primarily celebrating Galileo's discovery. So it's just a passing remark. Now, so this is the general concept. You have an objective lens or mirror. And the light gets focused on this detector, which can be an actual detector or a human eye and various other possibilities. And remember, the incoming light is from a star, which is in principle infinity. So it will be a parallel beam. This is another image of the same thing. And you see this, it gets focused here and it again diverges. And this is where the eyepiece. So human eye is trying to see this focused image. To this lens. And this is a picture of a refracting telescope even in use today called the Lick telescope and you can see the person standing here and it's huge. It's all fully enclosed. The primary glass is here, the primary objective and there are other things here and balancing wheels and all. So it is interesting that this telescope, such a telescope is still there at Lick Observatory in the US. So what are the advantages? They are quite rugged because after alignment, you don't have to do much with these uh, telescopes. Um, the glass surface inside the tube is sealed to atmosphere. And uh, since it is closed from outside, this total air currents are minimized and there is absolutely no turbulence inside. There is a raised hand. I will ask him to unmute. So. Hello, sir. Uh, you have a question, quick question, ask it. Sir, it is not a question, it is just a comment. What is that? Uh, sir, you said that the Galileo first made the telescope, but that is not correct. Galileo was who first pointed it on the sky and took observations. No, 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 no. 
Galileo pointed it as one of his jobs, but uh, the telescope was first invented by Galileo. So you check your uh, source of information. Okay, then uh, we go to the next uh, slide. Now, what are the major disadvantages of the refractor telescope? Now, this is a picture which shows that various places the light gets focused from this lens for different wavelengths. That's why I have shown different colors. And in principle, you will see start seeing rings of different colors. This is a very common thing uh, which uh, we used to do, even you would have done by using two lenses to make a binocular. So the problem is each wavelength is getting focused in this uh, prime focal plane at different positions. So you will not get a nice focused image here. The only, so this is the major, it's called the color distortion or color deviation. And this is, a, is an aberration. So the only way to, to reduce this chromatic observation, chromatic stands for colors, is, um, is to make some correction with another lens. So people use another, uh, they, they glue another planoconvex lens and other combinations. So to a great extent that can be reduced, but still it's a, it's a major drawback. And the other thing is that the refractive telescope, as you saw this picture here, can be very long because there is no option of folding the, the, the light in contrast to the reflecting telescope, so which you will see. So then people already realized since last more than 100 years that reflecting telescope is the, is the way to go. Of course, you have to compromise certain things and we will see that. Uh, but you notice that the reflection is taking place here. So the major effect of color aberration is all gone because it's a reflection where there is no color aberration. So what are the advantages? They do not suffer chromatic aberration. They have a big uh, surface here, uh, the big uh, heavy thing, which can be balanced very well uh, by using uh, mechanical uh, supports. They are, of course, much cheaper. The bigger problem with refraction was the bigger the glass, you had to have no bubbles. Surface has to be very perfect. So all those issues were gone. And why bigger? I mean, it will become very clear very soon. You have to have more and more light to be collected from a bigger objective. So as soon as you start making very big lenses, you get into problem in manufacturing. So mirror making bigger is not really an issue. In fact, the largest single mirrors today being used are about eight meter diameter, which is quite big. And then there are multiple mirror telescopes, which are now happening. In fact, when the first 10 meter or, or bigger telescopes were made, some 20 years back, people thought that these things are concept, they will never work, but they are already operation. Similarly, today, people are talking of uh, 30 meter, 45 meter dia telescopes. So these are not a single glass or a single mirror. There will be many, many mirrors, hexagons coming together to form a big telescope. And that is already happening. In fact, the, these two talks I will not be able to cover, but somebody might cover in your course about uh, India's participation in the 30 meter uh, consortium. So since it is reflecting off, uh, then passing through this, so only, only one side of the surface of this uh, glass has to be perfect. Now, what are the disadvantages? The biggest problem is misalignment. In fact, every evening before starting the observation, you have to do this focusing and all these things. And secondly, there is no enclosure it's a, it's a big telescope and you have outside atmosphere entry, which causes all these uh, turbulences. So there are ways to handle those things in a later technology, but we will not talk about that. And then often you have to use a secondary mirror to take the light out. Or sometimes you, you make a hole in the primary mirror and take the light out here. So... Yeah, essentially, this central mirror, the small secondary mirror, has to be supported by these studs. And uh, they don't affect much because actually what you're focusing is the object, not these things. So they won't even affect, except that you 
the minor light collection area is reduced. Uh, I'll just skip some of this. So this is this type of telescope is called the Cassegrain, since you are taking the light out from the primary mirror. And here, after balancing the telescope, you can put heavier and heavier instruments on the side. This is another picture of the same thing. And typically, this and this curvatures are matched. So if this is parabolic, this can be hyperbolic, and so on. Uh, I'll skip this Schmidt telescope. In this, see, uh, this is slightly old. Some twenty years back, you could have another mirror called the tertiary mirror. So instead of taking the light out here, you would take it to the side. And this is designed in such a way, whichever way the telescope is moving, this point will always come on your telescope beam. So which means for heavy instrument doing spectroscopy. This is a big advantage. But now that advantage is kind of handled by using fiber optics. So you can take, let the telescope beam come here and you take optical fiber and you can take the light to a different room. Of course, there are some losses in the fiber optics, but the advantage is then you can have really large instruments put at the back, which will be primarily spectroscopic instruments. I will show some pictures of such things in tomorrow's talk. Uh, before I move on to certain things, it's very important to, to see this slide because anybody who has done experimental physics or any experiment for that matter, the statics, statistics is extremely important. In fact, you may come across some of these terms in the other lectures just to make sure that you have a clear idea. Most of this you will get in Bevington's or Schaum series books right in the college level. But just revising everything in the terms of uh, how the research work is done and how the data is presented. So mean, it's very simple. Mean is if there are, if all you participants are of different ages, if I take a mean, divide by the number of participants, I'll get what is called as a mean, which could be, let's say, 20, 25, whatever this number. And then each of you, what is the deviation from that number? X bar is the mean, is deviation. And mean of that is mean deviation. See, again, this n is divided. Into. And then variance. This is because the mean deviation could be plus and minus. You take a square and sum it. And then finally, this is the sigma, which all of you would come across many, many times in all the lectures, is the standard deviation. This is a very simple calculation. A simple program can do this in C or program. This is what I am trying to converge and tell you what is plus minus one, plus minus two, and plus minus three. And it is very clear in the next slide. This is a set of scattered data points you know, on x axis and y axis. There are some data. And you would expect a nice uh, line fitted through this, uh, which is the best fit line. And of course, I have given y is equal to mx plus c. You can do this standard calculation. I think even at school level, they teach how to get this. M and C. Now that line is plotted here inside. Now what you see is that there are different data points which are scattered. In fact, some of them are very far. So my colored lines here, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, are those bands. Essentially, so plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three sigma. And you will see that in plus minus three, almost most 99% of the data has been taken. Here there are almost 200 data points. But still, there are one, two, three lying outside. That's why the 99%. So when people in the lectures talk about two sigma, three sigma, this picture should be in your mind. Okay, now the first definition, which I don't know whether it was covered, but as I said, let the repetition be there. So this is how the magnitude scale of stars is defined. Now remember astronomy, if not Galileo, at least it is more than 100 years, 200 year old subject. In fact, it's a very old subject. And people, till only last 100 years, human eye was the only detector. And all the observations were based on human eye. And you should know, just like your uh, human ear, which is in decibels, it is a log scale. Similarly, human eye sensitivity is also in log scale. That's why you will see that zero 
So this is the zero magnitude, which is the star Vega. And we'll come to that, where the Vega is placed, etc. But you see on the right side, you have brighter objects. And these are magnitude, these are in log scale. And this side you are painter, I'm sorry, it's just reverse. Sun, which is minus 26. And this side you have fainter and fainter objects, right? So Sirius, the brightest star, is somewhere here. Sirius is about one, minus one. And see, the moon, the brightest face could be as bright as minus 12. But you will see many, many stars. In fact, most of the stars are very faint. What even the best telescopes from Earth can see are in this order, plus 25. Of course, you can see fainter than this, but you have to collect many, many photons. You have to wait in the night for the whole night to collect the photons. They will be flooded with noise. So it's difficult. Space telescopes can go much fainter. But again, the faintness is linked to the area of the light collection. So there are limitations even there. And this is where the naked eye, uh, not a person like me who has specs, but if you have uh, good eyes, then you can see up to plus six. But plus six, again, not in a city sky, because you will have city sky lights, pollution, moonlight. You have to go to a very dark place, probably a village or something, ideally no lights. Then your human eye can see stars, which are up to sixth magnitude. We'll come to this again. So this is a kind of a comparison. Since everything is in uh, log scale, difference of magnitude between two stars, M1 and M2, if it is five, that means one star is five times more brighter than the other. The flux ratio, the amount of photons collected from such a star will be 100 times. Okay. So this is a simple log calculation. The log 10 is coming because of the logarithmic nature of human eye. So M1 minus M2 is F2 by F1. You can reverse this equation. F2 by F1 is 10 to the power 0.4 this. And here is a table. If the two stars have same magnitude, the difference is zero and the flux ratio will be one. And then as this angle example, five means 100. So now with this definition, sun is minus 26 and Sirius is minus 1.44, okay? And uh, this is the relation, it's a very crude relation, uh, magnitude limit for any telescope, diameter of the telescope. And uh, this doesn't you know, take care of many other factors. So limit, as I said, from this formula is coming as 6.5y because the human eyes uh, pupil size is about 5 to 6 millimeter. And you can see this is doesn't drastically increase. Even with the 6 inch telescope, it initially, it is going in a log scale. There is a question by Parag. So you can unmute yourself and ask quickly. Good afternoon. Yeah. Quick question. Yes. Uh, so uh, can I ask for a quick clarification on slide number 26? Number 26? Yes, sir. Yes. So over here, uh, these uh, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma lines that you have uh, drawn, uh, they are all parallel to the best fit line. So does that mean that uh, the spread that you are talking about, the spreading of the data points, it is applicable to the uh, Y intercept of the best fit line? Only to the Y, because when we are fitting something, we are fitting the slope as well as the intercept. So is this fit applicable only to the uh, so Y intercept and not to the slope? No, no, just to put your question in, in other way, this is for a straight line situation. You can have it with any curve. So this is a universal thing. If you fit a Gaussian curve or a sine wave, even then, these lines will not be straight lines then. Then they will be following the curve. You see? So it okay. has nothing to do with the intercept or anything. It is just the scatter from the best fit. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Let's continue now. I have come up to this. So now, uh, so if you see that the sun in this picture here is way outside. So suppose you are all sitting in your room and this is projected on your wall. This minus 26 will be going outside your room. It's, it's such a big scale. 
but very soon we will see why this is not true because till now in this definition we have not even talked about uh, the distance that's why this word here apparent comes because in astronomy the distances can be so large we will not even talk about cosmological distances in my lectures so everything is relative that's why all these numbers are still relative to one particular standardization and that is where the distance concept will come this slide shows one way of measuring a distance to the star there are other methods there are spectroscopic parallax and even even other uh, methods which i will not talk so you can see the earth's position at two different uh, times in the year january and july six months apart and this is the star whose distance you want to measure and when i say distance to earth and distance to this it's not much difference because these are fairly large distances in fact this set of stars here they are much beyond this star so related to this distant stars we are measuring this again the concept of relativeness comes here so with this angle which has to be measured so it's basically tan theta it's a simple trigonometry tan theta and theta are comparable so essentially theta so this theta is the angle which we are to measure so this angle one arc second you know what is one arc second it is 1 by 3600 of a degree that distance so if this angle is one arc second 1 by 3600 of a degree then that distance will be called one parsec one pc so which means half of this angle will make it double the distance right the concept is clear because if this angle is half then the star is even further away so two parsec so with this definition what is happening in the real stars which you see forget sun sun is also a star but sun is much closer all the stars are actually less than one arc second in fact even the nearest star uh, which is alpha centauri is 0.75 arc second it's at 4.3 light years 1.3 parsec slightly more than one parsec so this is actually i have given you the conversion also in this so one so 0.1 so as i said 0.5 is 2 parsec 0.1 will be 10 parsec and 1 parsec is 3.26 light year and 1 light year is typically 10 to the power 13 kilometer these are the numbers right in front of you and this method called trigonometric parallax method the limit is 100 parsecs beyond that measuring this angle becomes very tough now you see what is happening we are slowly entering the domain of absolute magnitude versus apparent till now everything was relative but now we are introducing the distance so if i put the distances in the real sense you will see this is what will happen now to understand this picture i have to tell you something more so what the astronomers decided was let's decide this 10 parsec as a standard distance how the standard distance is uh, defined you are assuming that you are sitting sitting on earth earth or sun or solar system doesn't matter because these distances are very large so let's say you are sitting inside your solar system and you have a shell around you a transparent plastic ball around you the diameter the radius of that ball from you is 10 parsec now for a moment all the stars in the sky just for a hypothetical moment assume they all come on this plastic <laughs> surface of the ball which means a star which is very far also comes here a star like sun which is close to you also goes back to that distance so 40 parsec star a real 40 parsec away star comes to this shell it has become four times closer 1 by r square law magnitude scale so 16 times brighter and 16 times brighter means three magnitudes back so which means a star which has apparent magnitude of when i say small m it is apparent v stands for visible this concept will become clear when we talk of visible band and other wavelengths is plus 9 that means at 40 parsec this star is at plus 9 and when i have brought it to the standard distance of 10 parsec it becomes plus 6 why because three times brighter so plus 9 becomes plus 
So this star now will have a capital M. Now I have called it absolute magnitude. We'll have capital magnitude plus M of 6. So this is the absolute magnitude of the star. Now by going in this method, uh, this is a quick thing about different bands, but we will come back to this. Just that small V which I put here stands for the visible band and so So the visible band, so this is actually the human eye colors and these are the wavelengths somewhere here is the 5500 angstroms, which is the visible band, which is the yellow green light of sun, which we are more used to from birth. So it's the V band is sitting here. These are each of them are about 1000 angstroms and uh, they are not exactly rectangles. They are having these shapes because these were measured and made these color glasses for the original measurements. So I will not go into detail. And this is a typical star whose uh, spectrum is seen here. So if I observe this star in V band, I will be picking up only this part of the spectrum from that star. So this table will make the things very clear. Now you remember I told MV for sun was minus 26. Our sun is a very bright star. You can think that it is bright, but actually it is faint. It's plus 4.9. So if I take it to 10 parsec, that means away from us, it will become a faint star. Sirius is changing the sign. There is a typo here, it will be 4.4. Rigel, this star, is a blue star. In fact, in winter skies, it can be seen over it. This is actually a very bright star, although it looks faint because it is far. But when you bring it to 10 parsec, it becomes really bright star. Betelgeuse also is a red star, becomes a bright star. And Vega, that's why people use this star. Luckily or coincidentally, or rather I should say the astronomer selected this star because hypothetically this star and really also it is sitting at 10 parsec. So if you take many measurements with this all over the world or even from wherever the participants are today with uh, different telescopes. If somebody in uh, Delhi gets counts of 220 for this star and somebody in Pune gets 210, then we both can cross check that our instruments can be calibrated against a standard star. Of course, to standardize these observations, there are many other effects, the telescope size, filter, many other things. But basically now you have defined a star, which is a standard star. And of course, this star is not available all through the year or all through the globe. So you may move uh, in, in, in time and some other stars will come, but you can always cross calibrate this with other stars. Okay, uh, let's go to the next. So again, uh, now there is something called telescope revolving power, uh, which is uh, related to the size of the telescope. So as I said, human eye has a limit of sixth magnitude. Now this is again talking about good human eye, good eyesight. Sharp vision can be one arc minute. Remember this is not arc second, this is one arc minute. Arc second is too small. Comfortable vision is four arc minute. So what is this criteria? It is 1.22 lambda by D. And this number I will clarify very soon. So this is the criteria defined by Lord Rayleigh, who was a British astronomer. And uh, this can be derived, but I will not go into that. Here, the lambda is the wavelength and D is the telescope. Or in our human eyes case, is the aperture of our human eye. So by this formula, you can tell what is the angle which you are seeing. So this is again two stars which are very close. They can be separated out when the cross section of these two, they are equal intensity stars, crosses at 80%. I'm not going into too much details of this, but essentially the, these two stars need not be equal intensity. If the one is still faint, as far as you can see it as a slightly separated, you will see that you have separated the two stars. In fact, I should make a passing remark, 60 to 70% of the stars in the night which you see, most of them are double stars. In fact, every day bigger and bigger telescopes are coming, better data is coming. Very soon we may reach that not just 60, maybe even much more, 70 or 80% of the stars, maybe two stars, three stars or multiple stars. 
So this is again the same thing, 1.22 lambda by t. Um, again, I'll skip this. This is important when you have a very good sky. The starlight doesn't form as a thing, but rather it forms what you call airy pattern. So in fact, a good sky can be can be calibrated by saying that you can see these multiple rings. Now let's see something uh, about the size of the telescope. What is 50 mm? It's about two inches. And 50 mm uh, is the typical size of a binocular, right? And that R, the resolution, the angle is 2.3 arc second, which means if you have two stars which are more than this away, two stars in the sky, then you can resolve them. But of course, if they are closer, you will not be able to resolve. And as you make this bigger and bigger, what is happening? You are collecting more and more light. But also, this angle is slowly reducing. You see, it has become one tenth. So 0.23 arc second. You can resolve very sharp features uh, on a planet or something. But why I have drawn this line here is, this is where the atmosphere is killing us. So this 100, which is 100 millimeter is four inches, is where the atmosphere of Earth doesn't allow you to resolve this fine because of turbulence. So whatever you do, even if you can make bigger and bigger telescope, this angle will become smaller. And a little while ago, I said you can talk of 30 meter size telescope. This angle we come, you can already give it, given as an exercise, what will be this 1.22 lambda, you take it as, this formula of course has to be all in same units, the centimeter or angstroms. Or, so you can take this wavelength as 5,500 angstroms. And the diameter of 30 meter telescope, 30 meter into whatever you convert to angstroms, you will get a very, very small angle. This angle will be very small. So it's, I mean, it's, it's really strange why people are spending so much money to make big telescopes. Now you will ask, then, then what's the whole point in all this description? Because atmosphere has taught me here. I cannot resolve anything beyond this. But there is a trick there. Somebody else will cover it called active adaptive optics, which allows you to see as good as space telescope. The Hubble telescope is in space. In fact, now it is almost... Uh, aging and another one will come up. Uh, the telescopes in space have no atmosphere, right? So whatever numbers you are making here can be really achieved because this line doesn't exist in space. But as I said, you will also have to make the telescope big. So you can't really ever think of launching a 30 minute telescope in space because imagine the amount of um, fuel you need to throw such a big object in the space. So those are the practical limitations. So people, what they have done is, they have come around this problem uh, by what is called as optic, uh, adaptive and optic, uh, active optics, by which you do something to the telescope mirror. And also you can sense the atmospheric turbulence and correct for it. And uh, you can actually achieve these numbers. So I told all this in one sentence, but it's a full lecture in itself which I can't be giving. So what are the telescope advantages? One is magnification, which means you can make finer and finer resolution of any object. So you make a bigger binocular, then you can see a distant tree. You can make a even bigger binocular. You start seeing the leaves of the tree, right? The same thing happening here because you are doing it within your earth, but with atmosphere, these restrictions will come. So this is the way to find the magnification focal length of the objective by focal length of the eyepiece. Again, it has to be the same because it's a ratio, so it has to be in the same units. The next important thing, so there are two things, magnification and light gathering power. How much light you can collect? Bigger, so one by R square law, you will collect more and more photons. So this is the light gathering LGP, is directly proportional to the area of the uh, telescope, which is essentially diameter square, right? Two or R. So human eye, eight mm. I said, eight mm is a dark adapted sky. Uh, eye versus a four-inch telescope. So you are getting one fifty-six times advantage. You can convert this to magnitude. How many magnitudes fainter you can go compared to sixth magnitude for 
uh, for a human eye. This is another thing which is, even though this is an old technology, it is still relevant here. And you will see this big number sitting here. So let me first tell you what is this big number. Uh, firstly, 360 degrees is full circle, right? 360 degrees. And one degree, so it is two pi radians, right? You have heard about radian. So one radian is this, 57.29 degrees. So any calculation, forget this lecture slide for a minute. All of you have a calculator. You know when you want to take sine 30, in the calculator it is actually dividing it as a ratio and taking it as a radian. Otherwise, you will not get the correct answer. So when you take sine of A by B, the A by B is a ratio, remember? So which means it has to be in radians. So this 57.296, if you multiply by 3600 arc seconds, this is the number you will get, 06-265. So what is the plate scale? Essentially, this whole argument about plate scale is you are taking an image uh, so with my cursor, I'm showing, suppose here, there is a big galaxy and here there is a telescope and you have a film here or, or a big photographic film on which you will take the image. Now, end of this galaxy has to come here. So the whole galaxy has to sit in this frame. And how do you make sure of that? You should know the plate scale. That means on each millimeter here, what part of the galaxy you are taking the so that's why this F ratio comes. The other quick way of understanding this is, which unfortunately already it is gone. Many people don't even own a camera. On the lens of the camera, you will have an F number written there. So this is essentially that. It is the angle of acceptance of the camera. Now of course, this depends on the aperture size you have selected and so on. So a typical telescope, an 18 telescope has an F number of 11. What it means is, the focal length of the telescope is 11 times its diameter, so which means 88 inches. If it is 8 inch, 88 inches. And another important thing is sun and moon, this is just a coincidence. Huh? They just happen to have half a degree as seen from Earth. This may not be true if you are on a different planet with its different moon. Just for Earth, both of them approximately are at half a degree. Which means if I have to take an image of sun, during solar eclipse or a full moon picture, I should know what should be my lens diameter and display scale and so on. So this is a simple way of calculation. F, the focal length is eight inch into 11 because this is the 11. So it is, the focal length comes to 2000 millimeters. And the plate scale will be basically this F by that number. So you put all those things correctly and it is 18.8 millimeters. So in the olden times, you had a, a film camera of 25 mm or 35 mm, you could get the image correctly. But today also, if you have a CCD based camera, you should be sure that other, unless the manufacturer has done this, you have to be sure that you get it on the film. Telescopes can be used in two different ways. One is imaging, which means you need the complete galaxy to be imaged or many stars to be imaged, which means edge to edge should be a sharp image. So this requires uh, careful optics design. The edges has to be very sharp, uh, edge of the image. Whereas photometry, you're not so much worried about the uh, details of the image, but rather you would like to collect all the light together of the object into one spot. Or for that matter, even if you want to take a spectrum. But still the difficulty in both these cases is because of atmosphere and your telescope drive problems, they will be jitter. And because of the jitter, the, the dot, the focal object will be continuously wobbling like this. So you have to make sure that the, all the light comes and collects. And in this case, you have to do many more things to take care of the jitter. But here, at least you have to be sure that you integrate the light for a proper time. And just quickly go through uh, some typical telescopes. This is the most common arch azimuth. So remember, 
Uh, this time and coordinate system, I don't know whether somebody has covered and I won't be able to cover that, of course, today. Uh, essentially, there are two motions. So uh, I will try to show this in the cursor. So when you're standing here, north, east, south, west. So north, this is done like this. So it is 90 degrees, 90, 270, and 360. So this is the way the azimuth is going, right? So that motion will be coming in this here. And the other motion is horizon to zenith. Zenith is overhead. So these two together uh, will define your observation. So essentially, you need two different motors to run this. In a simple telescope, it has no motors. Your hands are doing the same job. But the, if the motors are there, the star will not go away from the field. So this is the Jamaoni Cartesian Mount. This is the actual large telescope sitting here. And you can see this hole here. This is a kind of a horseshoe. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a fork in which this telescope is sitting. And this axis, that is the telescope moving from here to here, is from going from horizon to overhead. And this axis is following the, uh, basically this is aligned towards the celestial pole, not the pole star is about one degree away. This is uh, one kind of motion, but most of the bigger telescopes are alternative. So I said they are mostly alt azimuth uh, telescopes. It's slightly different. Uh, so uh, again, since this is not uh, a telescope stock, although I had to give these definitions to give you uh, some background, what I plan to do in the remaining whatever 14 minutes or so today is to start uh, on the black body radiation. Now, black body radiation is the most fundamental physics which all of you learn and you will realize in my lecture also that most of it is relevant not just for simple photometry which we will talk but even all the way up to cosmology which many lectures will be. So ideally a black body is a, is a thing which can absorb and radiate with 100% efficiency. Nothing in real life is this. So this is an ideal black body. Most of the Black bodies which you manufacture in, in the labs and something, they are usually sometimes their primary standards have to be related to the ideal one. And what are the parts of black body radiation uh, formulas, the Planck's law, all these have direct astrophysical consequence. So I will uh, continue with that. So this is a black body radiation. And these are different temperatures, 6,000 a typical sun, Sun surface is 6,000, and these are cooler stars. And you can see three things are happening here. When the star or the black body, why star and black body are similar, we will see that uh, later. Um, although I showed a spectrum of a star in my earlier slides, uh, the general envelope of the star spectrum is like a black body. And what extra thing happens are absorption features. So this will happen when we talk about spectroscopy but so this is a hot star and then you have 5000 4000 but what is happening is not only the curve is coming down it is also shifting towards red this wavelength here is in micrometers so i should also clarify uh, this wavelength concept in these introductory lectures because many people will use different units and very soon it can be confusing unless you uh, understand this well enough in, adv in advance so we know angstroms. So 5500 is, is the yellow green, which is the human eyes visible peak. That's why I've shown here, which is 5500 angstroms, which is 550 nanometer. One nanometer minus nine meter is 10 angstrom. And micron 10 to the power six uh, minus six meter. So one micron has uh, that many nanometers. So you can convert this. So one, one micron will be 1,000 nanometers. So these numbers will keep happening. And in fact, if you go to infrared, these numbers in angstroms become too large. So people try to show them in microns and so on. In fact, in, in chemistry lab, they even show as one by lambda, which is 
uh, wave number. So it is even more confusing. Okay, and you will see that this peak is shifting. The area under the curve is reducing, which is refers to the total energy. And uh, of course, the, the color of the object will also change. So this is another picture, yellow star, blue star. This star is quite hot, 18,000 Kelvin. And its peak is in the blue. And this is a red star. That's why red color is 7,000. So what is the Planck's law? This is all in MKS units. So this is some constant, H and C are Planck's and Boltzmann constant and C is with the flight. So here it is lambda kt by Lc by lambda kt, and this is in frequency, it is h nu by lambda kt. Because nu, the frequency is c by lambda. And if you differentiate this, that's why in this equation, you have lambda 5. So it becomes c by lambda square. So now we'll talk of the special cases. Vien's displacement law, where this h nu is much, much larger than kt, or hc is much, much larger than lambda kt. So here, uh, so, so now what will happen is this formula will take this shape. So this is, we'll come to that in more details, but this is directly talking about the shifting of the wavelength. And rayleigh jens law, again, the reverse of this condition, and you will see lambda to the power four. This is very important because in astronomy, why the sky looks blue is related to this. Because smaller wavelengths, is proportional to 1 by lambda 4, will be scattered enormously. And if you integrate the Planck's law, what you get is a sigma t4. So this is the Boltzmann, Stefan Boltzmann constant, and it's power of 4 temperature. So uh, typically for a star like Sun, if you put the T here, this is the energy radiated by Sun at its surface, which means every centimeter of surface of sun or, or any black body, at that temperature, we'll have six kilowatts of energy coming out. Vien's displacement law, again, it has direct consequence to astronomy. We put these constants. This is lambda max into T is about three newtons to minus three meter into K. So you put in the numbers, what is temperature of a star, which is 5,000, the peak will be in the yellow, 5,800 and is yellow. And here I'm showing a quick table how this affects us. Sun, that's why it is uh, yellow green. 6,000 is bordering to, to red, but it is yellow green. And then Earth, this is interesting. Earth's average temperature is 27 degrees centigrade, plus 273, 300 degree Kelvin. So if you put in the numbers, it is 10 micron, which means Earth is actually radiating as a source in the infrared at 10 micron. So any satellite which is trying to observe something in space, but Earth comes in the view, and if, it, if it's an infrared satellite, Earth will saturate it. So they try to avoid Earth when it comes in the field. The last condition you see, 1,000 micron. What is 1,000 micron? Is one millimeter. And what is the temperature? Three degree Kelvin. So all your cosmology lectures will be on this. All your double map and these satellites were basically in microwave region. And the precision of that was in measuring the fluctuations in this three degree background radiation in the, in the cosmos. So that is the nearest I will go in my lecture to cosmology. Um, I think this is a little more detailed, but let's go through it because these definitions are important. What is the total output of the star or black body? So that was sigma T4. So essentially, that is the one which I am putting here, and it's called the luminosity of the star. Now, remember this word luminosity comes at least in observational astronomy in three different uh, contexts, and it can be extremely confusing. The luminosity of a star and the luminosity class of a star, and this, the luminosity is the full energy of the star. So all the three, although the name is same, can have different implications. So how do you represent L? 4 pi d is uh, the distance of the star, and this is the temperature. You can reverse this equation, and this becomes like this. So average temperature of the star can be found if you know the luminosity and the distance. 
uh, when you say bolometric, it is referring to the black body radiation when I said there is nothing ideal. So this is referring to the ideal black body, which means if you are able to measure all the radiation of a black body in all the wavelengths minus infinity to infinity or zero to infinity, then that can be called bolometric flux. So it's a total flux measured by an ideal detector, equally sensitive in all wavelengths. But what you actually have is apparent, just like apparent magnitude, this is apparent bolometric magnitude. So M small b o l is related to this. So if you know the magnitude of the star, you can find out these things, the luminosity and so on. Continuing on that, this is one way of measuring the star's distance. So just skipping some steps here. This small m minus capital M is related to the distance of the star. So you can measure the distance of the star by doing these magnitudes. So this is star versus sun, this is the sign for sun, and you get L star by sun. And then there is something called bolometric correction. And even if you don't go into details of this, what is this correction? Essentially, it is the, you are assuming to be an ideal black body where it is not. So the difference of that is coming in this bolometric correction. Color index, at low temperatures, I have, that's why I've shown in red, all the objects will look reddish and high temperatures, they will look bluish. So what's happening? There is something called color index. B magnitude, I define the magnitude of the star as 2.5 log. So this is the B and this is the V. B and V bands I already mentioned. If this difference is negative, you can already see the hint here. B is, minus V is negative means this is more, uh, in magnitude scale it is the other way. So this is brighter in blue, that's why more negative. And this is positive for a cool star. This is again an approximate formula, B minus V, which can be measured. With this constant, you can get the temperature of the star. This is an approximate. So what is the effective temperature of a star? It can be found from this stephens boltzmann law. If you can measure at all wavelengths, in absolute terms, again, is not possible. And finally, at the bottom, I have mentioned sequence of stars, spectral sequence of stars, is a direct consequence of their temperature. Hotter stars uh, will have a different spectra and cooler stars will have different spectra, similar to the black body. So this is how uh, the spectral classes are given usually. This is a joke in many books, but O, B, A, F, G, K, M. These are M to O are the main seven classes. Very hot stars, sun is somewhere here and Sirius is an A-type star, and very hot stars can be B or even O-type stars. So what are the features here? Again, this side is the spectral types. This is the temperature, very hot stars. They are colors, orange, red. And what is happening? Very hot stars, most of the elements have evaporated. So only the lightest elements, which is hydrogen and helium are there. As the star is cooler, you will have heavier elements still in the atmosphere. And that's why the it will start deviating from a black body to show absorptions at these uh, different wavelengths. We will see these, these features. Um, this is a picture of stellar classification. Actually, I will show a little better picture here. Now you see in this picture, a lot of information. This is called HR diagram or Splunk Russell diagram. Most of the other lectures where people talk of stellar structure and evolution start from this picture. But what is this? On this side, you have hot star to red, cooler stars, O, B, A, F, M. Huh? And this side, you have luminosity, the same L. Sun is assumed to be one. The so sun is somewhere here. And then you have the stars. If you take measurements in the night for thousands of stars, then you will form what is the called the main sequence. In fact, today you don't even have to do this on internet. You can pick up all this information, the luminosity and spectral type and plot as a scatter plot. You will see some stars branch out here, here, and here. I think another picture, yeah. So this is where you see Sirius is sitting here, Vega is sitting here. These are all in the main, main sequence, but the partner of Sirius, the Procyon, they are here. 
region, these states have come out of this. So this whole deviation from the main sequence talks about stellar evolution, again, which requires a whole set of lectures. I'll uh, skip that. Uh, one last thing, and I think this is my last slide today, is this, forget about these things. Essentially, what is this formula you remember, flux, can do all this. So for a zero magnitude star, which is Vega, what you actually get, you put in these numbers, it's a simple number to remember, 1,000. What is this 1,000? This is 1,000 photons per centimeter square, per angstrom, per second. Again, from Vega, wherever it is, it is at 10 parsec. From the surface of the Vega, every centimeter square and every per angstrom and every second you have 1,000 photons coming up. So this light takes all 10 par 6, comes to your telescope, and you're collecting this light. And if you're collecting with a telescope with uh, 100 centimeter square, this factor will go. If you use a V filter, 1,000 angstroms, this will go. And if you are waiting for one second or one hour, this number will increase. So essentially, this is a standardization for Vega, and this is the number of photons. So, um, what I am going to do is, I can take, it's already 3.30, almost the last lecture of today. I will take a few quick questions, not many, otherwise you can send them on your uh, uh, other link. So, okay, um, I can see on the chat window there are some questions. Why fix a standard distance of 10 par 6? So, as I said, astronomy is a very old subject. That time people thought of 10 parsec, it could have been 100 also, it doesn't matter. So that number is not so religious, but it is some definition was given and people don't like to change. Uh, book references you will get later. Okay, and some books. Again, it is books. Uh, there is a question why Elgol star is called a devil star. This question I will not, this is a lot of mythology and stories behind, but it has nothing to do with that. Um, Tutorial mount. So I think some of these questions I will not be able to answer uh, today in the short time. There is a hand raised uh, by one participant. So you can ask. Yes. Ask your question. Unmute and ask your question. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, could you please suggest some books on uh, instrumentation or astronomy? Or astronomy I told you all these books, details will be there in tomorrow's uh, end of my slide. So you wait till then. But basic books are there, kitchen and so many other books are there. But uh, I will give you the full list tomorrow. Any okay. other question? Yes, there is another question. Bye. Uh, sir, I, I have a second question. May I? Yeah. Quick. Tell the question. What is the question? Um, sorry, sir. I couldn't hear you. Could you please repeat once? Your question, whatever you wanted to ask. Oh, actually, my question was, what is the advantage of uh, the schmidt triggered telescope? Uh, if you advantage of which telescope? schmidt trigger. I can't hear you. What, what telescope you are referring? I don't know. Uh, sir, can I just write it down in the chat? I think my voice is yeah, breaking. Give it on the chat box. That is better. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Somebody has asked me to go back to the absolute apparent magnitude. Uh, we'll start with the sizes. Yeah, I think uh, somebody is asking. Uh, so I am going to go to that slide about the absolute magnitude and scaling. This slide. So this slide is what it means. This is the apparent memory, what you actually see. And if you put all the stars on the 10 parsec, this is how they will look. It's just that. Then I think this person, Abhay Karnataki was asking. So this slide shows about that. And what else? Yeah, anybody else? has any question, either you are mute or you can put it on the chat. Any other question? 
this person has to unmute. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, a little louder. Yes, Anjali. Yeah, yeah I just have a basic question. We are using a black body uh, radiation concept to find the temperature, right, sir? Yes. Uh, from the wavelength. Is there any direct method to get the temperature? Okay, this is a good question. It refers to my luminosity calculations. The only, the only direct method of measuring the temperature of the star is to measure its radius because R and T are directly related in that relation. And unfortunately, only very few stars, their actual radius has been measured. And the procedure is uh, occultation. So for example, so I will show it by the cursor here. Suppose this is the, this is the uh, disk of moon or, or any planet. And my star is just my discursor. So this and occults this star, right? And again comes back here. So which means I will get, if I keep measuring the star's light, it will fall and then again rise. So this falling slope, if it can be measured very accurately, you can actually measure the size of the star. So this is the occultation is the and the only direct way of measuring the size of star. And till now about 100 such measurements have been done. Because see, coincidence, coincidences of stars getting occulted by the planet, it's, it's very rare event. But these occultations can be predicted well in time and people do these observations over the last so many years. The only new thing that is going to happen, it's still in future, is what you can do other ways to actually take the image of the star. Even though it's a point object, but only now with uh, bigger telescopes and stars which are still not that far, this is being attempted. And uh, you know people are detecting uh, moons and planets around stars. And they are talking of pla such planets which have habitable zone. All that is the big thing now. Mm -hmm. And that is another way of measure. So. So yeah, direct measurement is only, this is the only way. Uh, I, have uh, yes. I have a doubt, like when we uh, see about like neutron star, where the radius is very less, but uh, using this kind of radius, we we can be able to say the temperature, like it's a special case, right? Neutron star. No, 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 that will not be possible. It's a totally different ballgame. Neutron star is a very compact object. Mm. So you can't do that. Yeah, so there is a limitation of occultism. Somebody has asked, would we telescope radiates on its own? Does that become... So it's a, again a very good question. Um, see, the telescope is a metallic object just like Earth. It is also radiating. So when you are measuring in infrared, you have to go to a cooler side because the telescope radiation starts affecting the measure. So yes, uh, for example, people have put telescopes in very cold mountains like Hanley where the temperature itself goes down to minus 20, 30. So it's a big help, yes. Cooler telescope is better. Uh, somebody has asked before that, Junix and Gupta, uh, what are the special advantages of schmidt tigger telescope? So I didn't go into this. Schmidt telescope essentially is a very wide angle telescope. So it needs very special optics. You can image, if not whole sky, a big part of sky or big galaxies. So that is the requirement of, of a Schmidt telescope. I don't see any others. If there is another one or two questions I can answer, otherwise you can put your questions on the on the email and any more questions? Okay, I don't see any more questions. If you still think over, you can send them to my email and we'll meet you at the same time tomorrow at uh, 2.30. So thank you very much and uh, see you tomorrow again.